Hello, welcome back. So, have faith. Only about a hundred hours separate us from the end of the week and the beginning of the spring break. So there is hope at the end of the tunnel. In the meantime, this is what we're going to do today, Wednesday and Friday. Today, I'm going to talk about the chapter before technologies and revolutions, the media and the public sphere in early modern Europe. But I'll be able to catch up soon. Technologies and revolutions is not a long chapter. And with technologies and revolutions, we're coming closer to modern media. On Wednesday and Friday, the new app, the new digital app, will be DocuWiki, which is an open source server-side software that has a long history and is still used by hundreds of thousands of websites all over the world quite interesting, a bit historical, you might say, yet it's not a complete dinosaur because if you look at MediaWiki, then you, you'll be able to see that there are so many similarities between DocuWiki and MediaWiki, MediaWiki being the language, the app uh, that is used to build the platform of Wikipedia. And that's why I've chosen this one. Uh, MediaWiki is less easy to, to handle, whereas for DocuWiki, it'll be easier for me, for example, to create a test wiki on my server. AndreaFidi.com will do it together, we'll go through the steps so that you don't have to learn how to create, to uh, install a wiki on a server, but you can follow the procedure yourself. And then within this test wiki, you will have editing privileges and you can experiment more easily than you would with MediaWiki itself. DocuWiki will be the basis for the last digital assignment. So on Friday, we'll start create the, our first page in DocuWiki and experiment with it. And three weeks from now, you'll have to share with me the link to a page you have create inside the wiki test site uh, to show your uh, knowledge of the format and organizing features of this digital app. After DocuWiki, we'll talk, we'll go straight into Wikipedia because of the similarities between one kind of software and the other. Don't forget that the assignment due on March 9th this week, this Wednesday, entails the creation of a page in Evernote based on the contents of a recent video on this particular app. And in order to do that, you have to share with me a link check this page about the Evernote experience where you'll see what other students have chosen because every student will have to work on a different video. The videos are listed here in alphabetical order by the first, the very first uh, word of the title, even when that word is the, uh, it's being sorted. Uh, so make your choice and Again, if you need more time because your week is filled with terrible midterms, let me know before the deadline and tell me when you would complete this assignment, where, what your extended deadline would be. Now, this is the page with the notes about this chapter in the second textbook. I want to call your attention on a bug. After several years, I've been using Notion probably since 2018, and for the first time, I've had a glitchy page. Look at my table of contents, how they messed with it. That would be from The Godfather. Because it's half of the sections that I created are not listed there. It not, does not match the headings that I introduced on this page. And I've tried unformatting the heading, rewriting, typing again the headings, and they don't go into it. Only at some point from this 
conservative dilemma section, it resumed including automatically. I've tried the desktop app. I've tried, of course, different browsers and different computers. And it is the first time that a table of content is not working. And I've had table of contents for much longer pages. This is a page with, what, less than a 1,000 words, probably. I've, I've, I've explored the I've searched through uh, the Reddit community of Notion. I found only one person with the same problem a couple of years ago. They didn't find anyone sharing uh, a similar experience or a solution. I'll, I'll see what I can do about it. But it's interesting that right now the Notion is growing and becoming such a big corporate thing that uh, there's this unexplicable bug. Is, is found. Probably must have something to do with some kind of upgrade. The app is going through in the background and, and therefore they've added certain functions, but previous functions are not working as well. I'll, I'll see, I'll probably post something in Reddit and see if anyone um, can tell me something. Just wanted to say that. Okay, so what is the public sphere that this chapter of the book about the social history of the media talks about? Believe it or not, if you click on the link and you read the first paragraph in Wikipedia, you find a very simple, good enough definition and description of what public sphere is. Easier probably to understand than the first few pages of the chapter in the book. The public sphere is the sum of all the areas in society where public matters are discussed, directly, orally, or with the help of media, books, pamphlets, journals, magazines, or in our case, modern media. And this would be the direct definition of a public sphere, places where public matters are being discussed. However, there is an indirect side to it, that the book doesn't do a good job at presenting. Public sphere is also the sum of all the ongoing debates and discussions, again, directly among members of a community or indirectly through some kinds of media that has an impact on social matters. So even if social matters are not being, or public matters are not being discussed, those discussions may reflect on trends that are established and established and developed in society in reference to public matters. The definition comes from a book from by German sociology Jürgen Abermas from 1962, but you find scholarship for the next 50 years at least. Abermas talked about this in reference especially to the uh, uh, French society and European society of the 18th century. That is where we find the term public opinion uh, created in France in 1750. And the view of the concept is influenced, affected to a fault by the positive view of this period, by the assumption that our society owes a lot to the age of the Enlightenment, that that is really the beginning of modernity, uh, the, the beginning of the collapse of traditional society and traditional values, replaced by the values of true progress. Okay, so there is a bias at work, a positive bias in the view and the analysis of that society. And certainly it is true that the Middle, the upper middle classes in France, the so-called bourgeoisie in France, was engaged in a lot of arguments, debates, discussions, that's what argument means in this context in the book, about public matters, about planning the directions their society should take. And those debates were based on rational, arguments, logical arguments of some kind. That is to say, there was no appeal to past 
traditions. We should do this because it has been done. No, everything is re-examined just on the base of reason. And if anything doesn't make sense based on rational view of nature, society, politics, then reform becomes necessary. That's the nature of the process in this period and uh, within this geographical area. There is also the idea that since everything is based on reason within this debate, then the debate itself is open to anyone, right? Anyone who has a reasonable argument, anyone who has knowledge that is founded, well-founded, and that can contribute to the process of positive reform and innovation can contribute. Of course, we have to put everyone in single quotes because it is the upper middle classes. It is the top one, two percent of society that engage in this kind of discussion. And we'll see in other passages how during this period, the intellectuals in general have a negative view of the mob, the canaille, as, as they call it. They see the populace as constantly allied with the conservative and backwards sections of society, such as the church, such as the aristocracy, and not really being open-minded enough to receive the education that comes from the understanding of what a rational view of culture, society, and politics is about. Armed, as I said, with a positive bias, a positive view of this process, Habermas tells you that this system, where the public sphere is built, that includes the newspapers from the period, the coffee houses, because of course, coffee was the drink of the day. Uh, Starbucks is, is not new. Everyone wanted coffee. And of course, the, the second most popular product after coffee was cocoa, right? A cup of hot cocoa. But the coffee houses, the cafes, were a peculiar kind of social place. Again, it was accessible in terms of financial resources to the upper middle classes and above. And those were places where discussions took place, not just places of entertainment, but places where a lot of influential matters, relevant matters, were being discussed while drinking coffee. Yes, please. I'm sorry? The, 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 the upper class people at yeah. the time, were they in favor of the church or anti church? Against. Against the church, of course. The church was seen as an instrument of oppression, always taking side with the aristocracy and the monarchy in preserving the status quo because they had a vested interest, because they themselves, the clergy, had privileges that would be eliminated by the French Revolution. So uh, the idea was that the church was enslaving the minds of the mob, promising them that they should never start a revolution because violence is bad no matter what, even if they were subjected to injustice, even if they were treated unfairly in society, they would have the reward in heaven. That's the way intellectuals see society and religion, the connection between society and religion, and the germs of this idea will then be developed and be expressed in a more systematic way by Karl Marx, who famously said, religion is the opioid, the opium of the people, meaning it keeps their minds obfuscated and it gives them a false sense of serenity and joy, okay? And he used, of course, a reference to opium because opioids, opium was the number one medicine during the 19th century. You had a headache, you took some opium either uh, in, in, uh, by, by smoking and inhaling from a pipe, or they had all kinds of drinks, beverages, um, where uh, the, the byproducts of opium or morphine were included. Uh, and so whatever your 
general ma physical malaise was the first remedy for a large chunk of the population, not just the rich and powerful, was uh, to re resort uh, to some kind of opioid. And uh, as I said, that's why it became the metaphor, religion was seen as something that kept you quiet, kept you from rebelling and also something that was not based, grounded on reason. And we'll, we'll see in another passage how the intellectuals of the Enlightenment were not necessarily atheists. In fact, a lot of them believed that reason itself was a goddess. They erected during the French Revolution temples to the to reason as a goddess. And they, for example, Voltaire wrote a lot about God and about the creation of the universe and about the creator. So Voltaire, who was one of the leaders of this cultural movement, believed in a reason, a, in a religion based on reason. But the creator that he talks about in the pages of the book, where he goes through the traditional argument, look at the universe, look at nature around you, you see so much order in nature, that nature is like the, refi the fine mechanisms of a watch. Right? It works so perfectly that there must be a creator. This cannot be the, re the result of, of chaos. Right? There is design in here, so there must be a creator. This creator, however, for him, is not the God of the Bible, a historical uh, God that entered uh, human history with the Jewish people and then uh, after Jesus with the, the rest of the world. It is a logical entity that exists outside of human things that for whatever reason has created the universe, but he is not enmeshed in human affairs at all. So even when it comes to religion, they, the intellectuals of this period, the French intellectuals of this period, either reject religion or replace traditional religions with their own religion based on reasonal, reasonable argument based on reason, a, a more scientific view of religion, right? So you have within this notion of public sphere a system with newspapers, the coffee houses where these discussions uh, are uh, going on, you have clubs of different kinds, literary clubs and clubs based on the interests of their members. These clubs are very important because they are network. So they're in different locales in, Fran in France and they're connected to one another. In fact, they're often connected to similar clubs in England, in Italy, in Germany. So there is a European network where some new ideas about society and life are being discussed. And the salons are the posh living rooms of Parisian palaces or the mansions in the countryside of France where the aristocrats, in, in some instances, or the wealthy members of the bourgeois, the, the wealthy professionals of French society, entertain. And the women have, the wives of these people, have a leading role in this. Because, of course, you're talking about a group that has been excluded systematically from power, right? And a group that women is familiar with the process of working through an oppressive society. Because, of course, before the French Revolution, you still have an absolute monarchy that controls society, that uh, enforces censorship, right? And so women become leaders in a kind of practice where you have to dissimulate what you're doing. You have to pretend that the discussions that take place during these parties are not in any way a form of resistance, a form of opposition to the government, when in fact they are. But you have to use the language to mask what you are doing. So these are all the areas and the media channels where public matters are discussed, were they free as a whole, as a system, from manipulation? Habermas believed so. Burke doesn't, and I'm more on the side of Burke. 
it's clear that there was a lot of criticism of the traditional forms of government and a call for some kind of democracy. But again, it's mostly a democracy reserved to the elites in society. The debates are not uh, as free from influence as one could believe. These are the main points. Again, I'm trying to summarize the chapter so that you're not lost in the uh, mass of details that you find in there. What are the main points when it comes to Peter Burke's and Asa Briggs' criticism of Abermas? That Abermas has a utopian representation of the Enlightenment. That is because this view of the Enlightenment matches the social utopia of uh, leftist and Marxist uh, intellectuals such as Abermas in the 1960s. They envisioned the same kind of debate free of manipulation in their era, which of course we're talking about 1962 for the first book by Abermas about the public sphere. Six years later, you have the 1968 movements of great rebellion and change in society which happened in Paris in 1968 and then in 1969 and 70 throughout the world. The idea that there is no manipulation just because you have so many active players in this public sphere is again, again a bit utopian or the idea that participation is open because reason is the currency and therefore if you have reasonable things to bring to the table then you sit at the table, right? You are part of the process, again, is part of the political utopia of uh, the 1960s, really. And, of course, Abermas talks about the public sphere in reference to the French middle class and upper classes, but even the royal courts, both in France and England, were places where public matters were constantly being debated more than in any courts of the past where a lot of social information circulated and was subject to critical examination of some kind, not free from influence, right? In that case, influence was clear and heavy, and it's the influence of the monarchy and their authority. And people such as Louis, Louis XIV were very much aware of the fact that you can use the media to mount a campaign of propaganda to support the monarchy as an institution and did so heavily through the arts of the period, literature of the period, depicting aristocrats as natural heroes, depicting monarchy as a natural state for society. And going into other examples, Burke mentions the Soviet Union before the collapse of communism there is not like there is no public sphere simply because a government that is authoritarian, totalitarian, has almost absolute control over society. Even in the Soviet Union or in the countries of Eastern Europe subject to the communist uh, regimes, there was an alternative public, public sphere that existed underground. And in terms of media, when you take the Soviet Union, this is not mentioned in the book, but Xerox copies did a lot, photocopies did a lot uh, during uh, the age of the Soviet Union because it was easy for dissidents, for opponents to circulate ideas if they had access to a Xerox machine, then they could make copies of uh, newsletter gazettes and distribute them in circles where opposition was being conceived of and discussed. The final objection by Burke is that public sphere is not necessarily something that always exists and is relevant in any society. It may have to do with the circumstances of the historical circumstances. So in the case of France, this kind of uh, development of debates and discussion was conducive to the changes that were realized by the French 
revolution. So because of the fact that the process of the revolution was already started, public sphere acquired the relevance that it did rather than vice versa. It was not the public sphere that caused the revolution, but rather the factors that determined the revolution included this development, this enhanced relevance of the public sphere. Burke goes back correctly to other societies to examine what the public sphere might have been. He takes the example of Florence because Florence's city-state was one of the most powerful city-states in Europe during the 1200s and the 1300s. A uh, simple city-states that included the city of Florence and the surrounding countryside in an area smaller than Western Suffolk, yet uh, monetarily, financially, economically as powerful as the Kingdom of England. It was like the Switzerland of the period. Uh, they were uh, flashed with cash that they could use uh, for their poli to finance their political influence or to finance their economic growth. So, what happens in a city such as Florence during this period? You find in the documents of the period constant reference to il popolo, the people. Now, what is that they refer to is not the population of Florence in general, rather is the elites that count within that population. And namely, given the structure of that society, we're talking about those associated with who are members of trades and craft guilds. They instituted during the 13th century a system in Florence whereby your profession, if you were part of a, uh, an economically relevant profession, so we're talking about anything from the bankers to the blacksmiths or the butchers, right? Uh, so any entrepreneurial activity was identified with, had a lobby a guild where you could enter if you were deemed a legitimate member of the community and a legitimate entrepreneur in that kind of activity, that lobby gave you a statute, gave you rules to follow. And those various lobbies, there were the major arts, the minor arts, we're talking about a few dozens of professional organizations of the entrepreneurs, not the workers, right? The workers were not represented, but these organizations could lobby with the governments. And in fact, the governments were made by representatives of those lobbies, of those guilds. And there was a system that you find in here, which was very famous and imitated by other states, Venice, for example, whereby whenever they had to fill a high-ranking administrative position, the person in charge of justice, the person in charge of internal security and the police, the person in charge of taxation, then they would put the names of those who belong to those guilds. So we're not talking about a large number of people, probably two to 3,000 people at any given time. The book says that Florence had 100,000 people. I don't know why, because we have plenty of books about the history of Florence, usually the numbers are higher, around 150,000, I would say. So we're talking about barely 2% of the general population. Their names would be put in a bag, pieces of paper in a bag, and someone would extract the name and say, for the next two to six months, this person, Mario Rossi, is in charge of the taxation office, or is in charge of the police, etc. Of course, it was not as simple, don't be naive. Uh, whenever you have a lottery, there are all kinds of ways to rig the system, right? From physical tricks that you can use so that with your hand you recognize a piece of paper and you, you pull a certain one to excluding people. And uh, exclusions were constantly based on conflict of interest. You are not, uh, uh, you owe tax money to the state, you're excluded. You have a criminal uh, record, you're excluded. You've been accused of a crime, you're excluded. But then, 
Who's saying how much taxes, how much money you have to pay in taxes? Well, your, your colleague or your enemy, uh, someone who knows you, who's placed in, put in charge of the tax agency, and at this time there is no database collecting the evidence of your wealth. So it's completely arbitrary. The state will come to you, this agency will come to you as a merchant and say, from what we hear, from what we know about you, we think we assess your wealth at this level, and so this year you owe us 150 florins. And maybe that is a loss, that is unfair. But what can you do? If you don't pay, you're not able to pay, then you're excluded, right? So constantly, those who are in charge of the various administrative agencies have an interest to support their friends, ruin their competitors. And the same goes from the local level to the handling of foreign affairs, right? So those who uh, uh, belong to the uh, wool and silk guilds have an interest in maintaining a good relationship with France because that's their primary commercial partner. So they wouldn't support any act of hostility or any alliance that is considered an act of hostility towards France, etc. There is a heavy rotation that really ruins the stability of the government. As I said, at most uh, positions are kept for six months, but a lot of relevant positions change every two months, every three months, and this rotation, of course, creates instability. The other complaint they do um, they, they have all the time in documents from the period is too many people have access to secrets, to information that should be kept secretive, and therefore everyone is talking about everything else and everyone knows what Florence is about to decide. They even have physical places where they meet. In fact, some of the places where you go now in Florence, you don't associate with this system, but if you go visit Or San Michele, for example, that was the main place for the meetings of the guilds. And outside this edifice, which includes also a church and it's now a museum, you find statues and low reliefs representing the various professions that counted in Florence. And then you go to Piazza della Signoria and you find the piazza, you find the loggia, called Loggia dei Mercanti, and that is where they actually met and discussed things. Well, they have public meetings of of the one percenters or the two percenters of society. So there was a public sphere, right? However, this public sphere was not really influenced by the media of the time, right? It was mostly through orality that these debates came to a consensus. And therefore, you understand how humanism was born out of places such as Florence or other places where similar systems were in place. So you appreciate the relevance of elo eloquence, right? Your ability to argue and persuade the others of your arguments becomes relevant and therefore then you have to be able to read, to write, to build, to construct an argument. And the other medium that you find heavily represented in here is le letter writing. So there is a lot of writing of documents of different kinds by citizens who are sent out as ambassadors, as diplomats, or spies, and they have to write back to the city. This is one medium where you find communication and influence, a relevant medium, but nothing of the sort of the variety of media that you will find in France in the 18th century. Venice is very similar as a system, and then the book goes into the examination of five events where you can analyze the influence of media, the relevance of media in the construction of a public sphere. We will examine primarily two things, the Reformation and the French Revolution. Okay, so keep in mind that you can read through the others, wars of religion, the ancient civil war, the glorious revolution, but there will not be the focus of our discussions and it will not be on the final exam. Okay, I promise. And you have it on video. So what is the premise? The premise is that 
previous accounts of the history of knowledge and how media were influenced by such historical events as the five listed there, created the idea that there was a linear development, that the advent of democracy and the expansion of democracy and human rights was supported and produced by expanded access to news and information with the expansion of media such as the printing press, the newspapers, the journals, etc. That is a naive view and Burke is more accurate in suggesting that this kind of narrative, the development of democracy and human rights and the development of the media, looks more like a zigzag where access to information gets narrower during certain periods, wider during other periods without a constant development, but it's a constantly an act of narrowing and expanding from the 1500s to the French Revolution. Why is the Reformation important for us? Because the Reformation was heavily supported by the use of media such as the printing press, and that's why we will examine it, because we want to understand the power that media have to influence an outcome in society. And the Reformation is associated with the city-state of Germany, the same way that Renaissance comes out of city-states such as Florence. So their political and social issues determined the Reformation, which, if you're not familiar with the term, is the separation of Christian churches in Germany and other northern and eastern European countries from the Catholic Church, from the authority of the Catholic Church, and the creation of, on one side, the church that is redefined as the Roman Catholic Church, the other side, the various Protestant churches, which you still find represented even in the local territory, right? The Lutherans, the Anglicans in England, uh, the Pentecostals, etc., etc. Okay, but the birth of that movement is in, takes place in Germany. Again, first serious ideological conflict in which printed material plays a, a major role. But it is not just about religion, okay? So yes, the end result is the separation of local churches from the Church of Rome, the creation of other churches that in some instances, such as the Anglican Church, are national churches supported by the local governments, but it's about a social movement with ramifications and effects that go beyond the authority of the Pope over uh, churches that exist outside of Italy. Martin Luther is a member of the church, an Augustinian friar who started all of this in Germany. These are the accusations, the criticism by Martin Luther of the church, famously Luther affixed to the doors of a church in Germany, a manifesto where he listed his accusations against the church. What, to, to summarize his criticism, he uh, was resentful of the fact that the Catholic church was not a universal church, was heavily dominated by the Italian cardinals, okay? So most of the popes were Italian, not all of them, but most of them were Italian. The cardinals that held positions of power within the church were more often than not Italian. Then the famous accusation is the commercialization of sacrament, and, and this refers to the habit during this period of giving money to the church in exchange for pardons given to your relatives who had died. So the belief during this period, in case you're not familiar, is that you die, you were good, well, you were bad, you go to hell, right? You have mortal sin, you go to hell, and you spend eternity in hell. There is no redemption, no way out of hell, okay? The only people that got out of hell were the patriarchs 
of the Old Testament, Jesus, after dying, goes to the limbus, limbus patrorum, the, limbo, uh, the limbus of, of the fathers, and rescues the people from the Old Testament because they couldn't go straight to heaven without Jesus. So it has to be Jesus who takes them out of this liminal area of hell and takes them into heaven. Otherwise, you go to hell. Fine. You're done with it. We know what your fate is forever and ever. If you were not such a bad sinner, well, if you were a saint, you go straight to heaven. Fine. And that's your place forever and ever. Most people are neither terrible sinners nor saints. They have some venial, menial sins. So where do they go? They go to purgatory. Purgatory is like, he like hell because there is physical punishment, right? and uh, you suffer physical pain. However, there is a limit to, uh, to, your, to your suffering. That is to say, it's like a term sentence based on your sins. You may suffer in purgatory for 50 years or 500 years, and then you've cleansed your soul, you go to heaven. What is that your family can do for you? And especially if you were rich and you leave money expressly for that purpose. Well, they can go to the local priest or bishop and say, I'll pay you. And in exchange for this money, you or the nuns of this convent or the friars of this convent will pray for the soul of my father, the soul of my uncle, the soul of my grandmother, so that their penance in purgatory will be abbreviated because uh, God is supposed to uh, uh, find uh, nourishment in, in these prayers. And so these prayers will mollify God's attitude towards a certain soul, okay? And a lot of money enter the coffers of the church this way, especially through the uh, la final will and testament where people would say, I leave this much money to my wife, to my son, to my daughter, and then I give this much money for masses offered in, uh, for, for my soul after my death, okay? So Luther is saying this doesn't make any sense theologically that God should respond to this. And this means, clearly this means that the rich, those who have money for these things, enjoy uh, a shorter punishment in purgatory. Anyone without money will just have to suffer, it makes no sense whatsoever. But the church was encouraging this because it was a source of money. Then Luther criticizes the reliance of the church on magic, the emphasis on visions and miracles to convince the people of the uh, efficacy of the message of the gospels. And Luther wanted the laity the laymen, those who have chosen the secular lives, so those outside the clergy, the hierarchy of the church, to have a more direct involvement with the matters of the church. So the church should not be left in the hands of priests, bishops, archbishops, cardinals, and the popes, commanding over the laymen who are supposed just to obey. No, these, uh, the, the members of the secular community are also part of the uh, system. Of course, we know uh, one of the most famous things associated, ideas associated with Luther is read the Bible yourself. Don't just hear the explanation of the Bible from the priest, have the Bible, read it, and try to understand it yourself. In order to do that, we need to have a Bible that is not in Latin, but is in a vernacular language. And this is part of the debate even during the Middle Ages. For example, St. Francis, had uh, the Gospels, at least the Gospels, in vernacular language. He didn't read the Latin version, right? So this means you take the authority from the church, right? Because instead of listening to the source of authority over the scriptures and taking what they say the scripture mean, and also the selection of the scriptures, right? Because there are parts of the Bible that are not included in the cycle of the masses that goes on for three years in the Catholic Church, you can read everything and you can try a critical approach to it without following the uh, 
authority of the church on that. Martin Luther wanted the liturgy also celebrated in the vernacular, which happened in the Protestant churches at Lyon. For the uh, Catholic Church, it took until until the Vatican, Second Vatican Council of the, the early 1960s for this reform to happen. And, and you may be familiar, I don't know if you've heard, of the debate uh, between the end of last year and the beginning of this year, where the church with Pope Francis uh, uh, issued a document, Tradiciones Custodes, where it's saying, well, you shouldn't be celebrating the Mass in Latin anymore. Because he noticed that in a lot of dioceses, and this is true of U the US as well, a lot of people were attending masses in Latin. And there was a lot more interest and growth in the Latin traditional celebration of the mass than the vernacular celebrations in English or French or Italian. And the Pope said, oh, stop, stop, no more. You can only celebrate mass in Latin under these circumstances. If you are an old priest, who was preaching in Latin, if you belong to a certain order, but otherwise, this is the new language of the church. Latin is not the vernacular. Latin is out, the vernacular is in, with a lot of resistance. And I'm not talking about the churches. You go to on YouTube and you find plenty of videos on this. And this idea of democratization of the church is expressed with the phrase, the priesthood of all believers. It's not the priests are above me and I'm just a simple believer. We all have a different kind of vocation, but all vocations are important. Okay, so through the Bible and this ideology, we have direct access to God's message without mediation, which means I can have a Bible in the vernacular language, I read it, and it's uh, my view, right? That's why the book talks about a privatizing effect. Instead of religion being public, right, I have to think of religion in a way that is in compliance with what the church says to be saved. Now, it, it becomes a personal matter, right, which continues up until now. The idea that, yes, you can be religious. It's your own personal sphere, right? You go to church, you read the Bible, you pray, do whatever you want. But it's your thing. It's not something that should uh, be relevant for the whole of society. You, you find that mindset at its extreme in today's society. Okay, and and these matters became matters of public opinion. How? What media were involved in this formulation of the public sphere? during this period, a lot of pamphlets, simple short books, often portable books, small uh, with ideas, promoting the ideas of Martin Luther by 1550, so about 30 years, 33 years after the declarations, the statements by Martin Luther, you have already 10,000 pamphlets in Germany about these matters. So public opinion is being influenced through the media of the printing press. Of course, it's not just the press, because not everyone can read on their own, but these pamphlets are being read in public or in small circles and groups, so some people simply hear from others. Others become the vehicle of this, uh, of this ideology, so there is a lot of secondary orality, secondary because these ideas start from the page and then they go from mouth to mouth, from mouth to ear, okay? And it's especially important that these pamphlets can reach local opinion leaders. This is the two-step theory of communication by Ka Kazik, yes, I, I think, uh, in Lazarsol. Uh, so the idea that you don't need to, even now for an electoral campaign, you don't need to influence every single voter. You influence the opinion leaders in each community or even in each family because their voice will be stronger and will be heard by the people around them. And this happens with these pamphlets. And then another vehicle, of course, is music. 
religious hymns in the vernacular, and even ballads, secular music, echoing the issues of this debate, influenced the public sphere of the period. A lot of printed images, you, if you cannot read, you can see these images and the book has one or two uh, positive images of Martin Luther with the bird, the Holy Spirit on his head. God is inspiring him. And also these interesting satirical representation of the Pope and the church contrasted with Jesus. Jesus, a poor man from uh, Palestine, right? Living a life of frugality and poverty. And the Pope dressed like a king, entertained in a court of aristocrats because the cardinals are aristocrats. Okay, so are they uh, uh, considerate of the message of Jesus. No, that's why they shouldn't have authority over these matters. Multiple publications of the articles of Luther against this manifesto against the church. Of course, the printed translation of the Bible and printed translation of the small catechism, which is a booklet explaining what religion is about according to the new principles so that you can read and educate yourself instead of going to church and listening to the priests only. And the other effect, and here you see the social ramifications of this movement, are that through the circulation of texts such as the Bible in German, you have the standardization of German language, which is not simply what the populace uses as a language. It's not the language of the streets. Is First of all, there is the issue that in Germany at that period, and you can feel the differences even now, but especially during that period, uh, Germany or the empire included a lot of areas from northern Switzerland to uh, almost Denmark or the southern part of Denmark from uh, Eastern, uh, Western Germany to parts of Eastern Europe, a lot of different dialects. So the language chosen by Luther is a language that is somewhat understood by everyone. Okay, so it's a language that is not, doesn't have a strong specific identity, mixed with the official terms, the formal language of the administration of the state. The chancery is the, the combination of all the administrative offices of the empire, right? So it's not just the printing press that makes this change is how the, the product of the printing press is formatted. In this case, what kind of language is picked, right? If they had chosen a different language, then it doesn't matter how many copies of the Bible had been printed, the influence would have been more limited. Once again, don't discard the influence of traveling salesmen. Printing press and traveling salesmen go hand in hand People who go door to door selling these pamphlets, selling religious books, selling these images, right? And they sell them in the houses of the farmers. They sell them in the streets, in the markets. They travel with these big ba baskets full of books. When they're done, they go back home or they go to a, a, a place where they can buy more items to sell. And talk about the influence in terms of democracy they even think in some places of giving people the option of voting. Do you want to remain Catholic or do you want to become Protestant, right? In Germany, but this example is considered even in Venice, right? The idea, because Venice wanted to be independent. They resented the authority of the Pope over their matters. And the conservative dilemma would be the constant issue when you're facing, as a central, powerful authority, you're facing this kind of revolution and resistance, what do you do? Because if you engage in a dialogue, then you're saying that your enemies are important, that they're gaining ground, that they're making progress, right? So oftentimes, in the conservative dilemma, the choice is ignore what is going on. It'll go away. Just don't admit that your authority is losing ground. And the church responds not with pamphlets, but with bulls, with uh, the official documents of the church. And it takes them until 1566 with, to come up with a catechism of Trent, after the Council of Trent, which will be in use 
until the end of the 20th century without much changes. I'll stop here. I'll continue another time.